There is perhaps no other portion of the Bible that is better known and more familiar with more people than the Lord's Prayer. And there are really good reasons for that, and I'm going to touch on them in this video. The Lord's Prayer touches on both heaven and earth, the eternal and our daily lives. It lifts our eyes off ourselves and it challenges us at the same time, yet it is incredibly brief and concise. There are going to be three acts in this video. In Act 1, I'm going to look at the background to this prayer. Act 2, we're going to look at how the New Testament records it. And in the third and final act, we're going to take a detailed walk through the prayer itself. And if you stick around to the very end, I've got a bonus section for you. So grab a good cup of coffee and let's dive in. If you're new to this channel, my name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and other graduate institutions in the United States around the world and bring it to anyone, anywhere on YouTube. So if you find these videos useful, please subscribe. That way YouTube will let you know when I post new material, give it a thumbs up, and share it with someone else. But I digress. Let's get back into our topic, the Lord's Prayer. Prayer was certainly one of the central elements of Jesus' life and teachings in the New Testament Gospels. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is portrayed as the Messiah whose relationship with the Father is characterized by prayer. Let's get into Act 1, Background to the Prayer. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, did he come up with a completely new prayer, fashioning it out of nothing? I don't think so. We need to keep in mind that in the Jewish community, they had a long history and tradition of prayers. All you have to do is look back on the book of Psalms for evidence of this. But they had other prayers that they said in their private lives and also during corporate worship. One of these is the Kadesh. It is still recited in synagogues today, and the opening line of the Kadesh reads, Exalted and hallowed be his great name in the world, which he created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom in your lifetime and in your days, and in the lifetime of the whole household of Israel, speedily and at a near time. Now, if I put the opening stanzas of the Lord's Prayer up against this, you'll notice how both prayers are centered on God's kingdom. They both open with the petition for God's name to be exalted or sanctified, and both also pray for the establishment of God's kingdom. And they also refer to the world and God's will. Now, there's a great deal of debate as to how old the Kadesh is and whether Jesus worked off it or not, sort of the chicken or the egg type arguments. But that's outside the scope of this video. What I mainly want to show you is that there's good evidence that there were prayers within the Jewish community that contained similar themes to those found within the Lord's Prayer. Act 2. The Lord's Prayer in the New Testament. Let's dive into the text itself for a deeper look at the Lord's Prayer. Turn with me to Luke chapter 11. After a quick introduction in verses 1 and 2, where the disciples come up and ask Jesus how to pray, you get the Lord's Prayer in verse 2. Jesus says, Father, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Now notice how compact and dense the prayer is. What? Wait a minute. What are you saying? Is this is not how you pray the Lord's Prayer? This is not how you remember it? But look, it's right there in Luke chapter 11. This brings us to the second idea that we need to consider when we look at how the Lord's Prayer is recorded in the New Testament. Matthew and Luke record the Lord's Prayer for us. Luke's version, as I read, is much shorter than Matthew's. So what gives? Why are Matthew and Luke's versions of the Lord's Prayer different? Well, there are several options for this. First, Matthew and Luke could be recounting different instances when Jesus taught them to pray. But given how similar they are, they're both in the Sermon on the Mount, and that there is no other record of Jesus teaching his disciples to pray like this, I think it's best to assume that they are both writing about the same lesson in prayer. Second, Luke could have shortened his version, but that usually doesn't happen when one author is working off on another or in oral traditions. The tendency is to expand what the earlier account had written or the oral tradition. Third, Matthew could have expanded the prayer. 
Take a look at the first line Luke has, Father. Matthew in Matthew 6, 9 introduces it with, Our Father who art in heaven. Now let me just ask a quick question here. When you pray the Lord's Prayer today, which version do you use? Luke's? No, we use Matthew's. Why? Well, one, Luke's version is much more direct and it's shorter, straight to the point. Matthew's is as well, but by having our Father who art in heaven, it balances this first line with the next three that will follow. And it gives the first four lines a rhythm and a flow that Luke's version does not have. This is why we use Matthew's version. It works in worship. Now, this is a tendency that we see throughout Matthew's gospel. In fact, Matthew's gospel has been called a manual for the church or the church's gospel since the earliest days of the church. This is because of how he blends the life of Jesus with the teachings, practices, and needs of the life of the early church that he ministered within. At this point, one or two of you might be questioning, does this mean that Matthew made it up or that this prayer doesn't represent the actual words and teachings of Jesus? No, let me explain. There's two concepts that relate to how you quote someone, and these go back to ancient antiquity up to today the ipsissima verba and the ipsissima vox, the very words or the very voice. In English, we can do this with direct or indirect quotations, even the marks within the text itself. Greek did not have that. Luke's account of the Lord's Prayer, I think, is closer to the ipsissima verba, the very words that Jesus used when he taught on the Galilean countryside. Look at how direct and immediate his prayer is. It's very short and straight to the point. Matthew's version reflects the ipsissima vox, the very voice of Jesus, and it does it in a way that makes it function for corporate prayer through the ages. Act three, let's take a walk through the prayer. The first thing I would like to do is read the first half of this prayer in Koine Greek so you can hear the beauty of this prayer. The first four lines are all structured in a very similar pattern. But the second, third, and fourth lines are all exactly the same in their grammatical structure. This gives them a rhythm and a rhyme to them that is not reflected in the English. So let me read this for you. Pater hemon ha en tois oranois, that our Father in heaven. Then we get the second, third, and fourth lines. Hagia theto ta anamasu, eli theto he basileosu, gine theto ta thalemasu. Now I'm going to color code this for you so you can see it. Each line begins with a verb that ends with a sort of an eto or eto ending. Then we have a noun. This is in yellow. Name, kingdom, will. And then they all end with the second person possessive pronoun, yours, su in Greek, and that's in pink there. And I've color matched this in the English here so you can see how the word order has to be rearranged to make sense in English. Now this makes a beautiful sing-song effect. Let's start with line one of the prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. The prayer opens by addressing God directly. It's very characteristic of Jesus' prayer life to address God as Father. The first line also contains a paradox that we often skim over because it's so familiar with us. God is in heaven, a realm remote and completely other from ours. Heaven is eternal. It exists in harmony with God's rule and his presence. We live in a temporal, changing world that faces crisis, degradation, needs, and is not characterized by God's rule. God is also our Father. We have an intimacy with God who is remote and in heaven. The Lord's Prayer reflects and is structured around this paradoxical relationship with God who is in heaven and us here on earth. The second, third, and fourth lines, hallowed, come and be done, are all third-person imperatives. I know we're getting a bit grammatical here and you haven't been in junior high for a long time, but let me explain why this is important. A second-person imperative would be something like, give me that book, hit the subscription button, I'm commanding you to do something. A third-person imperative would be along the lines of, someone get the barf bag. We're having this nebulous someone 
who we are addressing the command to. But in reality, imperatives like this are really second person imperatives. It's directed at some unidentified person who we don't know or aren't sure of. The problem is, is that these third person imperatives in the Lord's Prayer are not addressed to a person. We really don't use this type of grammatical construction much in English. They're rare. Let me see if I can give you an example so you can understand what I'm talking about. You're getting ready to go to work. You go out to the car and it won't start. And in your frustration seeing the car, you cry out, start, Dagnabbit. And Dagnabbit is a rather interesting grammatical construction itself called dissimulation to avoid saying something we would rather not. God damn it. But I digress. If you can think of other third person imperatives directed at a thing, not at a person, please drop them in the comments below. Some Greek grammarians argue that a third person imperative, like we have here, is employing what they call a politeness strategy. We as God's inferiors are asking God to do this in a very polite way by addressing it to something associated with him and not directly with him. However, I think that misses the point that's being construed here. These imperatives are aimed at impersonal things, name, will, and kingdom. As such, a third person imperative is a perfectly good way to volitionally will that these things will come about in Koine Greek. This raises the question, how will these imperatives be fulfilled? What are the implications of these commands? How does a name do anything? How does a will do anything? So does God do it or do we do it? Because this prayer opens with an address to our Father who art in heaven, these ideas of your name, your will, and your kingdom being fulfilled, I think God is definitely implicated in these commands. At the same time, these commands call us to have the right stance if we are going to pray this. We need to be ready to put our time, money, and efforts where our mouth is as God fulfills these commands. Line two, hallowed be your name. Hagiasteto ta anamasu. The idea of God's name implies several things. In Israel and the ancient Near East, how you used a person's name conveyed your relationship to them. If you were over them or under them in authority, provision, or protection. In the Hebrew scriptures, the name of God was above every other name. It was so set apart and different from any other name that it wasn't written in the Hebrew Bible in a way that could be pronounced. As opposed to the prophets who rebuked Israel for dishonoring God's name among the other nations, here the prayer is, is that God's name would be honored and glorified. Lines 3 and 4. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Elitheto hapas leasu, ginetheto tathalemasu. Once again, we see this paradox from the first line, our Father who art in heaven, carried through here. God's kingdom is perfectly reflected in heaven, and it will be in the future as well. In that day, the lamb will lay down with the lion, we'll have the wedding feast of the lamb, and we'll have access to the tree of life again. When Matthew's gospel is taking place, God's kingdom is dawning in the life of Christ, the newborn king, Emmanuel, it reflects sort of this already but not yet tension that's throughout the New Testament. God's kingdom has already dawned in the birth of Christ, but it is not yet fully realized that will not occur until Christ returns again. As a result, this prayer has a very strong future element to it. We are praying that God's kingdom will be fully consummated, that his will will be realized in all aspects of creation. Fifth line, on earth as in heaven. This line forms a transition between the first half of the prayer that is focused on God and the heavenly realm to the second half of the prayer, which focuses on our experience and needs here on earth. Now the English misses this connection and this transition. If we went with a very wooden translation from the Greek, it would read along the lines of, as in heaven, so also on earth. The word order moves from heaven to earth just as the prayer does. This line forms a bridge between the first and second parts of the prayer, and it also moves us from the heavenly realm, the first half, to the worldly realm in the second half. Give us this day our daily bread. 
We should immediately see the shift at this point. We have moved from God's kingdom and the eternal to the human needs, daily bread. This use of us here is not singular, but it's plural. Our prayers are not for our personal needs, but for us as all believers. It is a collective prayer. It is for the benefit of the entire community. Now, one word that's very strange here is this word daily. Luke has, on the other hand, each day. But Matthew has a very interesting word choice here that we translate as daily. This can refer to bread for today or bread for the days to come, a future orientation. And it's only used here in the New Testament. And from all the other manuscripts that we found from this time period, this is the only instance of it. In fact, the third century theologian, Origen, thought that Matthew coined this word himself. It was that unusual. This makes it a very difficult word to translate. It has something to do with day, and Luke gives us a helping hand in how we translate this as daily in Matthew. However, I think it is best to take it as ambiguous, referring to both our present and future needs. We are praying for our present needs, bread to eat today, and also for the future. The main thrust is that God would give us what we need, not what we want. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is perhaps the most challenging and difficult part of the prayer to digest, especially if you come from a Protestant background. The whole idea that God would forgive us to the degree that we forgive others is rather difficult. It shows an interdependence between how God forgives us and human forgiveness. It breaks forgiveness open from a personal affair to a community of believers, to those around us and in our world. It also ties our experience of God's forgiveness to our forgiving other people. And just in case we miss the importance of this, after the prayer, Matthew continues, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will God forgive you your trespasses. Matthew 6, verses 14 through 15. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This final line admits our weakness and waywardness. This is not sort of Chuck Norris theology, sort of make me tough as nails to resist every form of temptation. Rather, it's please keep me away from these things. It expresses our dependence on God and our own frailty. We are wholly dependent on God's grace to sustain our lives with him and it admits that we will stray if we're left to our own devices. Then finally, we come to the last line, deliver us from evil. Once again, the wording here is rather ambiguous. Evil is an adjective, but it can function as a noun, just like in English. Now, as an adjective, it could be referring to something like an evil act or an evil deed or an evil person. As a noun, it's probably a euphemism for the devil, the evil one. The way that Matthew has constructed it here, it could be either deliver us from evil, from evil things, evil temptations, anything that we would describe as evil. Or it could be a noun, deliver us from the evil one. Given how carefully and poetically structured this prayer is laid out, and also that it has other ambiguous words in it, for example, daily bread, I think it's best that we try and hold both of these possibilities open at the close of the prayer. Deliver us from evil desires and temptation, but also from the evil one. Finally, you may be familiar with the end of the prayer that reads, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. But neither Matthew nor Luke include that line. This actually comes down to us from the early church document called the Didache. And if you have a study Bible and you look at it, you'll have a little note that says something in regard to this. The Didache, or what was called the Teaching of the Twelve, was a very popular sort of how-to-do church book that was widespread in the early church. And it was written around 90 to 100 AD and almost made it into the New Testament. Now in the Didache, chapter 8, it records the Lord's Prayer for us, exactly how we have it in Matthew's edition. But at the very end it reads, But deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the power and the glory forever. Now what takes place here? Why do some versions of the Lord's Prayer include or recite this line at the very end? 
The Didache probably reflects the earliest traditions in the early church that closed the prayer with a doxology, a practice that comes down to many of us even to this day. And I'll leave a link below or somewhere in the video to a copy to the Didache so you can read it yourself. And there's online versions. I'll include a link to that as well in the show more section under the video. The great British theologian James Dunn summarizes the prayer like this. The prayer is amazingly comprehensive despite its brevity. It sets human need within a heavenly perspective and in accord with divine priorities. It prays for us without being narrowly or exclusively introspective, and it covers the needs of the present, past, and future. Words with such timeless relevance and yet able to express specific and occasional needs make the prayer truly unique, constantly repeatable, without denigrating into vain repetition because it is expressive of all human condition of whatever time or place. Well, this has been an incredibly fast and thick pass through the Lord's Prayer. And if you found this useful, please hit the share button and let other people know about it as well. Until we meet again, peace. Mm -hmm.